Good evening and welcome to Greenfield Public Schools School Committee meeting on Wednesday, February 10th, 2021. This is our regular meeting of the month at 6 p.m. This meeting is being held fully remotely in accordance with the Governor of Massachusetts' March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GLC 30A, Section 20. We'll start with a roll call and a call to order. Secretary Johnson Moussad, would you do a roll call of attendance for the school committee, please? Member Karen? Here. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Here. Member Hollins? Here. Secretary Johnson Moussad, I'm here. Chair Proietti? Here. Member Wall? Here. And Mayor Wiedegardner? I don't see the mayor. Yeah, I don't yet see Mayor Wiedegardner on the line. We do have a quorum, correct? Yes, we have a quorum. Thank you. So we'll call to order at 6.01 p.m. Just a reminder to all the people on the line, it is important to mute yourself. Um, I can mute for you, but it can interrupt the meeting. So please keep that and mute. Uh, we'll move into, I believe we have two sets of minutes to approve tonight from previous meetings. I would take a motion to approve both sets together. Um, the first is from Wednesday, January 13th, 2021. The second is from, I believe, January 25th. Just trying to find it. Yep, January 25th, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve both sets of minutes? So moved, Johnson Musad. And a second. Second, Ekstrom. Thank you. Any discussion? I'm hearing none, so let's do a roll call to approve the minutes, please. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Motion carries. May we debate there yet? Is that correct? Correct. Thank as far you. As I can see. Yep. Okay, so we will move into the public comment portion of the evening. The way we run this, if you're not familiar, is we will first take folks who are on the WebEx uh, remote meeting platform with us and are able to type into the chat your name uh, that indicates you want to public comment. A good reminder right now is that the chat cannot be used for any other function. Uh, we wouldn't allow people to discuss or talk during a meeting in person, and the same goes for a chat uh, during school committee meetings. Other than uh, indicating you want to public comment during this portion of the meeting, uh, you should not use the chat function at all. Do we have anyone, Secretary Johnson, who saw signed up for public comment? One in the chat just yet. Oh, yes, um, Mike. We do have someone, I'm sorry. Yes, Michael Sustick. Just give me one second, Mr. Sustick, while I mute people here. Looks like we're good to go. So you have three minutes. Please state your name and the town you live in before you uh, make your statement. <clears throat> okay, my name is Michael Sustick. I live in Northampton. I'm a teacher at the Four Corners School. Um, I am public commenting tonight. Um, it's on the agenda. You're discussing MCAS um, and how that's going to look this year. Um, so I just want to bring um, to your attention a resolution that got um, fully supported by the Greenfield Education Association eBoard and membership, um, which states that um, we reject the call for two uh, students who will graduate in 2022 that missed their 10th grade MCAS because of the pandemic um, to not have to make it up. Um, and additionally, to call for moratorium on all high stakes testing um, for the year of 2021. Um, so all students can benefit um, from the time um, focused on direct instruction. Um, I have the full 
um, language of that email to the school committee. So you can go back and read that if you prefer. Um, but there's a number of reasons why I and um, our, our teachers feel this way. Obviously, the first being the mental and physical health of our students. Um, can we safely get them into schools COVID wise? Um, even if so, is their first introduction to school after a full year of being apart going to be six feet apart in a cafeteria for 90 minutes while they take a high stakes test for multiple days and then we send them back home? It's it just doesn't feel it just doesn't feel the right way to welcome children back into school, especially at the elementary level, but really for for all levels. Um, there's a question of reliability with the test. Um, certainly with a year of remote teaching, things are going to be very different, you know, so are the results of these tests that we won't get back for another full year be something that really we're going to use to indicate the um, growth and strength and, um, and, you know, areas for growth for our schools just doesn't seem like the year where the results are going to be um, all that valid and useful um, for planning purposes. Um, and then there's just the question of, you know, of the bolts. Do we have the transportation to get kids there? Do we have the proctors to teach it? Um, well, kids who have um, their IEPs that say they can take longer than 90 minutes, have longer than 90 minutes. Cool. Will kids that uh, need um, IAs to take a test with have those people available? You know, there's a lot of um, small details that go into it. And um, just want to make sure that we're all aware of um, how, you know, how difficult that could be to plan. So I uh, move that you, um, or I ask that you support the resolution, which was supported by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees um, by a vote of 112 to nine, um, and um, that that be communicated to our state legislators so they know that, you know, Greenfield agrees that we M this is not the year for MCAS. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sestic. Appreciate your comments. Do we have other public comments from the chat? Anne Valentine with uh, Doug Selwyn on tap. And Anne Valentine, please go ahead. State first your full name and the town you live in, and then we have three minutes to comment. Sure, my name is Anne Valentine. I live in the town of Hatfield. I teach in Greenfield, of course. Um, and I'm also the GEA union president. So I noticed on the agenda tonight, you have the um, next year's calendar on the agenda. Um, I noticed in the packets too that there's not a draft calendar to look at. So I'm going to assume it's up for discussion for for the your board tonight to discuss um, next year's calendar. So um, the association is really looking forward to working cooperatively with the administration about uh, the calendar. Usually we um, will receive a, a draft calendar from the um, a superintendent um, before March 1st, where we can talk with our, our um, our staff about suggestions, comments, concerns. We bring it back then um, to the superintendent to then be brought forward to the school committee um, by April 1st. So I know that there's been a lot of discussion on the teachers parts about start times, end times, how this year we could look at um, as uh, changes to the calendar, some maybe some positives from COVID. Um, and we are just looking forward to being able to have a great open collaborative discussion on maybe thinking outside the box and working together um, to create the 2020, ooh, 21-22 calendar. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to receiving that from who's ever going to be the designee on that one and um, kind of getting down to talking about what we can do for next year's calendar together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. I appreciate your comments. And I think uh, Secretary Johnson, we said you said that Mr. Selwyn is on tap. Is that correct? Yes, followed by Garrett O'Brien. Okay. Uh, Doug Selwyn, if you want to go ahead, state your full name first, the town you live in, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Doug Selwyn, uh, Greenfield. I first became deeply concerned about standardized testing in the late 1990s. In previous years, working with mostly white middle class students, the tests were worthless and annoyance, but no big deal. But that, that, that year in the late 90s was different. My students were mostly second language learners. Only four of my 24 students spoke English at home and many were recent immigrants. The students were a joy to work with, full of energy, creativity, caring, and curiosity. The classroom was alive with their laughter, their joy at being together, and their passion for learning. And then we hit testing. 
And I watched them struggle through page after page after page after page of contextless, meaningless, worthless test questions, sinking in their chairs and dissolving into tears. After a while, they were simply turning pages, defeated, convinced they were failures after all. I started having conversations about my concerns, and there was a consistency to those conversations. Yes, we know the tests are harmful to many students. Yes, we know they're bad assessment. Yes, we know they do not help us as educators. And no, there's nothing we can do about it. If we refuse to give the test, we will get fired or punished, my colleagues would say. There's nothing we can do. And I should note this was even before No Child Left Behind, which came in in 2002, which made the situation much worse. So here we are in 2021, more than 20 years later, and the conversations I have with people have not really changed. Folks agree that the tests are toxic. They're still biased against students of color, against those living in poverty, students with learning challenges, ELL students, and those whose learning strengths are in different areas. There's no evidence that shows they improve teaching and learning. They continue to eat up money and time that could actually serve our students. And no, there isn't anything we can do about it. We'd get in trouble. Maybe the district would be punished, which would hurt the children. Well, my reply at this point is that the children are already being hurt and they've been hurt by that 20 years of inaction. In fact, children have been traumatized, stressed, and wounded by testing for more than the 20 years since my first awareness and it had been going on long before that. We are not powerless. We are instead choosing to do nothing, hiding behind our fear and reluctance to buck the bureaucrats in Boston and DC. As we continue to wring our hands and do nothing, another year's batch of children are being traumatized and stressed and defeated by those abusive and worthless tests. We are not helpless. We are the adults in the room and we can act. We can stand up for our children, their teachers, and their families, all who are being harmed by testing. First, I hope our school committee can sign the resolution advocating for suspending the MCAS for this year. And next it's time, we're in the middle of the pandemic and there's no assessment expert in the country who would find the results test meaningful. And then I hope we can have the courage to decide to choose not to test the children. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Selwyn. Um, I think Secretary Johnson, you said you told me who was next, and I forgot. Is it Gary O'Brien? Is that right? Yes, with Stephanie Coffin on deck. Okay. Garrett, if you're on the line, go ahead. You have three minutes to state your full name and the town you live in. All right. I'm Garrett O'Brien. I live in Greenfield. I'm an IA at GHS and I'm membership co-chair of the Greenfield Education Association's executive board. Uh, I'm here to assert also that you all adopt the MTA's resolution number one regarding MCAS and high stakes testing. Uh, the GEA eboard and our general membership support this resolution's call for a moratorium on all high stakes testing in the 2021 school year unanimously. Uh, there are myriad reasons to support an MCAS moratorium this school year, but preserving students' precious time on learning may be the most important. With the challenges that students already face while navigating the uncharted COVID learning environment, uh, it is unwise and unnecessary to subject students to the undue stress and the educational time commitment that preparing for the MCAS or other high stakes tests entails. While the global pandemic marches on and creates new and complex challenges within the educational landscape, it's important that educational stakeholders don't simply go through their routine paces in the name of following educational models that were established in more ordinary traditional times, which of course we do not presently find ourselves in. Uh, lastly, while scanning through tonight's meeting materials that were posted earlier today, I noticed that the School Committee's Racial Justice Advisory Committee also unanimously approved of the MTA's resolution number one through a motion at their most recent meeting on February 5th. After hearing the unanimous support of GPS educators and knowing that a subcommittee of your own unanimously supports a 2021 MCAS moratorium, I hope that you, the GPS school committee, will vote to adopt the MTA's resolution number one, 
for the good of GPS students during these challenging and ever-changing times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Is it Stephanie Coffin that's next? Is that correct? That's correct with Paul Jablon up next. Okay, uh, Stephanie, you have uh, three minutes. Please state your full name and your town before you begin. Yep, Stephanie Coffin. I am from Greenfield. I'm a parent of three children within the school district. I have a third grader, a first grader, and our youngest will be entering kindergarten in the fall. My family is one who has had to make some major life and career decisions in order for this school year to happen within the Greenfield district. We had to make the hard decision to have our four-year-old forgo a year of preschool, as remote preschool didn't seem to be a financially or academically positive experience, despite other preschools in the community being opened successfully. I, like many other parents, was forced to leave my regular job in order to support my children in their remote learning. I'm grateful that I'm a nurse in the community who has worked throughout the healthcare system and have supportive managers, so I'm able to continue to work, but not without significant financial or emotional sacrifices to my family, as my hours are now nights and weekends. I spent much of this year advocating for my son to be evaluated. Our appointments have been canceled four times. The district is now in non-compliance of a 30-day evaluation by over a month. At this point in time, only half of the evaluation has been completed and parts are still left unscheduled. I was happy to see when he was seen at the school that there were many protocols in place, distancing, air purifiers, masks, plexiglass dividers in place. The list goes on. I have emailed the school committee, the superintendent, and the principal on a number of occasions to express my frustrations of the trials and tribulations of this process that has been exacerbated by the lack of in-person availability. As a nurse in the community, I wanted to speak about the risks and benefits of our children being in school. At this point in time, the social, emotional, and mental health benefits of our school children being in school far outweigh the risk of COVID, in my opinion. There are safety protocols that can be put in place that would allow our children to be back in school safely. There are resources available for guidance on these protocols, including the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, both of which are in support of in-person learning. The AAP says that we cannot eliminate risk, only mitigate it. The scientific data shows that our schools are not considered a place of community transmission with the safety protocols in place. And with these safety protocols, my husband and I absolutely feel comfortable sending our children back to school. It has been mentioned that teachers shouldn't have to go back to school or parents won't send their children back without teachers vaccinated. The vaccine was approved for emergency use administration only. It cannot be mandated and should not hold up the process of getting our kids back to in-person learning. There are so many students and families at home struggling and suffering, never mind the parent-child relationship, the stress and pressure that is on parents managing multiple children with multiple learning platforms, especially parents of elementary students. Our school system released a plan this fall as mandated by the state. There's been minimal movement on this plan, and I understand that there are many moving parts as to why it hasn't progressed, but it's time to revise the plan and move it forward. Recent newspaper articles have many parents concerned as it has brought to light the poor communication and lack of transparency with the community, but that also extends between the teachers and the school committee. I encourage our school committee, our acting administrators, and the teachers union to come together and push these plans forward sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Coffin. I think we said Paul Jablin is next. Is that correct? Yes, followed by Emmy Phelps. Okay, Paul, go ahead. You have uh, three minutes. State your name and your town you live in before you begin. Okay, I'm Paul Jablon from Greenfield. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the committee for addressing the MCAS resolution tonight, and not only addressing it, but for many of you, I have known that you have read extensive research about the MCAS and other testing. Put it briefly, it is an un unkind, anxiety-producing, non-needed set of evaluations that steals hundreds and hundreds of hours from teachers actually teaching in their classrooms. MCAS has never been a useful tool for teachers. And so I'm glad that you're not only asking that it not be given at all this year, but that you're asking for a moratorium so that we can look at the only time 
that student achievement has increased and that the gap between the gap between people of co students of color and their white counterparts has narrowed was before MCAS. I'm glad that you are taking the lead of school districts in Franklin County who are looking to pass this resolution. I thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Yablin. Uh, Emmy Phelps, was that correct? Yes. Correct, followed by Susan Borgaftik. Okay. Emmy, you have three minutes. Please state your name and your time you live in before you begin. Hi, my name is Emmy Phelps, and I am a resident of Greenfield. I have two children currently enrolled in the Greenfield Public School District. I am calling to urge the, the committee to, in a timely manner, develop a hybrid model plan to get our children safely back to in-person learning this school year. I know that I am not alone when I say that I and my family have had to make huge sacrifices and difficult decisions to ensure our children's safety and support their learning throughout this very challenging year. I had to choose between being a parent and running a business. I did not have the choice to do both. I had to close a childcare business that was essential not only to the financial well-being of my family, but essential to the community as well. It has been widely researched that remote learning negatively impacts the emotional and mental health of children. And as a family, we are experiencing this firsthand. My children, like many other, are experiencing anxiety and emotional strain. In talking with other parents, this is a common, this is common in many households right now. Not only are children exhibiting anxiety, but depression and behavioral issues as well. These children are children of all ages. Our children are not okay. The emotional toll that this has taken on our children is devastating. If we don't act now, I fear that the damage for some children will be irreversible. This is our, our future that we are talking about, the future of our community, the future of, uh, of our country in our world. Our children are crying out for help. The time is now. I ask you that you put your individual ideologies aside and that you focus your energy on getting our children safely back into, into to pers in person learning the school year. Many schools in Franklin counties have begun a hybrid model of in person learning, and many schools across our state have been doing this safely and, successful, and success successfully all along. The CDC states that it's imperative for our children's social and emotional well being to participate in in person learning, and the data supports it being done safely. In addition to the CDC, the, Acad the American Academy of Pediatrics supports in-person learning with safety protocol in place. It is time to move forward. This is why I'm urging you to, in a timely manner, develop a safe in-person learning hybrid model for the remaining of the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Phelps. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Susan Wargastic, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very pleased that you are taking up the NCAS in this meeting. And your, I'm sorry, state your name and the town you live oh, in. Sorry. You begin. My name is Susan Wargaftic. I live in Greenfield. Um, I am, as I said, very, very pleased that you're taking up the MCAS at this time. It's an essential issue that we need to do, and I, I appreciate the, the work that, you, uh, that the, the uh, committee is doing on it. Um, I have um, a, a message that uh, from a teacher who wanted to remain anonymous but asked that the um, these sentiments be presented, so I'm going to do, read that now. Um, and the question that the teacher was asking was, how do teachers think this MCAS will affect students? And the comment from the teacher is that they believe that the MCAS will crush their esteem, their self-esteem, um, that, that we need as teachers every moment of this year to try to help students make up for what they have missed and that the at the end of the year as well as to move them forward in their progress it took months of work to get teachers and students to a place where remote teaching and learning were, were productive and comfortable and that really did hinder progress severely the test would cause the students stress and would and many would shut down it's too high stakes at a time when the schools could not always be consistent 
Currently, students are struggling to connect with school and giving them a high stakes test at this time would only make matters worse. My own child is disconnected and finds school difficult to share with remote learning. So the test, the, the MCAS would only be a negative response from uh, this uh, teacher's perspective. Students have had an incredibly difficult year. They don't need the stresses of MCAS on top of it. Students report experience severe depression, anxiety, and stress this year. Testing would do nothing to support, educate, or engage them. It would only push more students away from their education, and it will harm relationships between students and educators. On behalf of this, this teacher, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Susan, for your comments. If there's someone else I did forget who it was this time. There is one more person, Lucas Martin. Lucas Martin, go ahead. Uh, you have three minutes to state your name and your town before you begin. Hi, I'm Lucas Martin. I live in Greenfield. I also teach at, at the high school. I also um, am a member of the executive board of the, the Greenfield Education Association. I'm also a parent of a kindergartner at Four Corners. And my comments are going to sort of, I'm going to be sort of wearing all of those hats, I think, in my comments um speaking as as all of those people <laughs> at once um on monday of this week um on behalf of the union we submitted a, a letter to to you folks uh, asking for for information about the current leadership of our district um i'm not going to repeat uh, or reread the entire letter you all you all have it um i just want to sort of reiterate our request um for clear information not only about the um the current state of leadership but about we all have a search committee forming you folks have a search committee forming um to to make a replacement in the superintendent position um and would would like sort of on an ongoing basis uh for the for the rest of the year to have clear information about uh, a plan of succession who who will be in charge in the meantime who is in charge now um i, I was a member of the search committee uh for the superintendent uh six or seven years ago and I, I know i'm well aware that it's not a quick process and so i don't think anybody thinks we're going to have a brand new set, a superintendent in the coming days or weeks and so uh what's going to happen in the meantime um i just um reiterate a request uh on behalf of the staff um to know who is in charge on behalf of parents to know who is in charge um and the general public as well um to be clear, you know, nobody's nobody's asking for any personal information that would, of course, be confidential. And we know it's a personnel issue um, and the details of the current superintendent's uh, situation are, are confidential. And we respect that. Um, I think everybody does. But um, knowing that uh, there is an absence of, of leadership and, and or or a replacement for that leadership, I think, is in the in the public um, interest and I think should be made public and should be clear uh, from here on out. Um, that's all. I, I, I want to also acknowledge how difficult all of your, your jobs are in, in these times. Um, as a teacher, I can appreciate that we're all sort of doing something that's basically impossible and we're doing our best. And I think that it probably extends to you as well and how much time you guys are putting into it. Um, so I, I, I un we understand. Um, we just moving forward where we hope to have have very clear information about about leadership and um and that is all i'll leave it at that thank you mr martin thank you for your comments anyone else from the chat secretary Johnson, Ms. yes we need uh jamie winnell and uh someone else is making a request to read comments from teachers who wanted to stay anonymous no, absolutely no more anonymous comments from anyone, whether they're teachers or anyone else. Um, okay. I'm sorry, who was the next person? Uh, Jamie Winnell, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes. Jamie Winnell, if you're on the line, go ahead. You have three minutes to state your full name and your town you live in before you begin. Thank you. My name is Jamie Winnell and I live in Greenfield and I am grateful that the school committee is talking about MCAS tonight. I'm also grateful for the GEA for proposing the moratorium and I would like to give my full hearted support of the moratorium and looking at this very important issue. I'm working full time and in person with ELL students with a small group and it is very difficult to do it safely and we are doing the best that we can. Um, the, the prospect of bringing in the entire 
middle school to conduct testing is a honestly logistical nightmare, but more importantly, I believe it is a moral failing. Our students are suffering this year. Everyone is suffering. Our teachers are at at a breaking point, honestly, and it is very, very difficult this year. And we're doing the best we can and we're pulling through for the kids. But to conduct these tests for that, for data that would essentially not give us a realistic picture of what these children can do, I don't think serves any of our time and is not a wise use of our funds. So not only would I like to uh, support the moratorium, I suggest using that funding towards mental health services for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, I appreciate your comments. Um, if you told me the other name, I forgot it, I'm sorry. I didn't. It's uh, Elle O'Connell has signed up since uh, Jamie began. Okay. L is it L O'Connell? The way it shows up on the chat is just L O'Connell. Okay. Are you with us? I am. Did thank you. you. Yeah, it's okay, actually Liz your, O'Connell. Okay. And I'm from Greenfield. And, okay. Go ahead. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. I am a resident of Greenfield, obviously, and I have a child at Four Corners, and I wanted to let you know that I too am concerned as to why we haven't heard of a concrete hybrid model for our return to school. Um, many of the school districts in the nearby areas seem to be able to find ways to get back to some in-person learning. I'm wondering why we're not following what they have done, especially now since the CDC is urging schools to return in person. My next uh, item I would like to just discuss is I'm wondering if someone could give us an outline of where all of the COVID money that came in initially was applied to and how much is remaining and what the plans are for that. And lastly, I would also like to mention that I too am concerned as a citizen in regards to the lack of communication uh, about our situation with the superintendent being on leave of absence. I understand fully um, that we don't need to know details in regards to that, but I'm un unclear as to why we weren't informed. And I'm unclear as to who's handling the leadership um, in her absence. So I was hoping we could get some clarification on that as well. And thank you for your time. That's better. Huh? Thank you, Ms. O'Connell, for your comments. Thank you. Secretary Johnson, is that anyone else in the chat? There is no one else in the chat. Okay. And we'll move on. Anyone who is with us but unable to type in the chat and wants to verbally uh, announce that they would like to make a public comment, you can do so now. Going once, going twice. I'm not hearing anyone, so we will move on. I know. Just quickly check, uh, muting people. Okay, so it looks like we can move on from public comment. Thank you all for your comments. I also want to acknowledge we are receiving, um, as always, the emails from the community every day. Um, and acknowledging those and reading those. Uh, we appreciate all comment, regardless of if they come during a meeting um, or other times through email or through other contact to us. Uh, your feedback on what we're doing uh, is important and we appreciate it. So we'll move at this point into committee reports. Um, I'm actually gonna forego my, my report at this time. Uh, I know we have a number of subcommittee reports and um, we do have a full agenda tonight so I would like to start hearing from, uh, actually, let's start with, uh, the superintendent is not with us tonight, and I will um, actually turn it over at this point to uh, high school principal, Karen Patnode, uh, who has some students with us and um, has a, also an a award presentation. We like to have good news at, uh, at the school committee meeting, and certainly 
Uh, Danny and Shane have been the highlight for several of our, our meetings recently. So I'm looking forward to hearing their report and then uh, the award presentation following that. You guys can go ahead and unmute and take it away. Um, I'm Danny Linois. I'm a senior at GHS. Let's see, where's Shane? Uh, hi, I'm Shane Toomey. I'm in eighth grade. There we go. And so first off, I'm just going to give you some reports on basically what's happening at our school right now for students. Uh, first, I have a student council updates. The Polar Plunge is an activity hosted by the Special Olympics in order to raise money for the organization. All students and staff are invited to participate. Fundraising is optional and registration is now open to everyone. However, the plunge is at the end of March. Uh, you can plunge however you, you would like, like ice bucket challenge, eating a bunch of ice cream, plunging in a hot tub. Um, and student council also attended a virtual roundtable with the rest of WMSC, where they discuss building community virtually, fundraising, mental health and self-care, working with administration, what it means to be a leader and how to recruit and keep membership. Each person was in three 15 minute roundtable discussions and we are partnering with the Washington Street Preschool in Greenfield in order to send Valentine's Day cards to the students there. This project was presented to the council by one of our members whose mother is a teacher at the school. The hope of this project is to build a community with young children. Other community, community groups, excuse me, were also asked to participate in the project. Earlier today, Key Club volunteered for the Stone uh, volunteered at the Stone Soup Cafe to bake cookies for the homeless. The group is also uh, writing letters to the elderly, as well as attempting to connect students together through social media. And then at GHS TV, a new semester started, so there's a new crew. Uh, once a new episode is created, we'll be sure to share that. Uh, GHS athletes are excited that there's still been some sort of sports season for winter sports. Uh, the girls' basketball team has been on fire and is currently three to zero. Boys' basketball has, has had uh, has lost a few close games and stands at one to do. And hockey, even though they lost them from the last year, teams have not missed a single beat and is currently three to zero. We do all over hard work on the court and on the ice. So we have virtual best buddies, and this the group has been meeting with the students in the Rise and Life Skill programs. Personally, I'm in the group and it's a lot of fun because we do morning circles and we just try to incorporate people with disabilities more into the school community. And um, it is open to all staff and students and you even receive a fashionable long sleeve t-shirt. And if you want to participate, just contact Ms. Mass for more information. French Club is hosting their annual candy grams this year virtually. Uh, you can send your friends or Sweetheart, a nice message by the Google form posted in the Google Classroom. Uh, they were due yesterday, so they will be delivered on time. And while the candy might be missing this year, it most certainly is not. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Shane. I heard I missed a, a fun dance party and advisory the other morning, so I'm going to have to check it out one of these mornings. Um, I just want to end uh, the, this part of the presentation, though, with honoring one of our seniors, Alara O'Brien, who I believe is on the call. I gave her a heads up that she would be recognized tonight, and I thought I saw her face earlier. Alara is Greenfield High School's recipient of the Superintendent's Award for Franklin County for Greenfield. She is currently ranked first in the senior class. She has a cumulative grade point average of a 4.46. She has taken every rigorous challenging course our high school has to offer. She's won the University of Rochester Xerox Award for Innovation and Information Technology. She She's a National Merit Scholarship Commended Student. She's a College Board National Rural and Small Town Recognition Program winner. She's a member of our National Honor Society. She's been a president of the French Club since 10th grade. She's a member of the Audio Visual Club. She volunteers her time by speaking French uh, with an elderly woman in a local nursing home. She also is an expert marksman. She's been hours competing and practicing in pistol shooting comp 
competitions. Um, she lives with her father and her, her grandmother, and she is headed to Yale. Congratulations, Alara. Well deserved and so, so excited for you. So thank you for giving me a few minutes to honor and recognize her. Congratulations. Thank you, Principal Patnode and Danny and uh, Shane. We appreciate you being here. It definitely, like I said, was a highlight. And Alara, um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's impressed by that list. Holy cow. Um, and going to Yale, that's fantastic. Uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, please come back and tell us all about it. Um, yeah, awesome. Congratulations. That's, that's just terrific. All right. So we will move into subcommittee reports. I think we might have four subcommittees that have reports tonight. I jotted down a quick list. Uh, budget, racial justice, the superintendent search, and then maybe the redrawing has a report. Yes, okay, I'm seeing uh, Melba Wall nodding that they have a report. So let's start with budget. Um, actually, why don't I take my time <laughs> when we come to FY22 budget update rather than okay. labor it right now? Sure, thank you, Member Ekstrom. Uh, so let's do racial justice. Uh, absolutely. Um, we've had a couple meetings since our last gathering and um, working on two things. Essentially, one, as was already mentioned during public comment, uh, we did vote unanimously to support the resolution around MCAS that we'll be looking at today, um, in particular because of the disproportionate negative impact of high stakes testing on low income and uh, people of color communities. So. Uh, for that reason, we, we as a racial justice uh, advisory committee took that up. Um, we're also working on um, an event where we want to gather public input on racial justice issues in the schools. And we're taking an approach of uh, consulting widely with the community in the organization of the event to make sure it's accessible and that, it, that um, we're reaching reaching people in many ways, but in particular through this event. But we're also uh, setting up other ways for people to um, share input with us. So um, we have a um, email address just got set up today, thanks to the technology director of racial justice at gpsk12.org. Um, so um, we'll be issuing a press release and um, an announcement to community organizations that we're seeking comment as we design that event where we hope to both receive public comment on racial justice issues and also start to build relationships with people who might be interested in serving on the committee. Thank you, Secretary Johnson Rasad. Um, do we, are you looking for a vote on your resolution from the committee? No, the, uh, the, okay. the resolution from the committee is just to recommend that later in the agenda when uh, when the committee full committee takes up MCAS to vote um, uh, for that resolution. Great. That's what I assumed, but I don't want to assume. So thank you. Any questions okay. from school committee members for Secretary Johnson Rousseau? No. Not hearing any. Thank you for the report. Um, and for people following along at home who have the materials, they are accessible also on our website, the gpsk12.org website under the school committee. Um, you can find tonight's agenda and supporting materials and all of the information, including the entire resolution on MCAS um, is in the packet for tonight. So you can see it there. I next have, um, oh, Jim, that's perfect. And I didn't even plan to have you just do both of yours. So why don't you do a superintendent search first and then the I am collecting letters of interest for those of you who would like to join us in uh, on our superintendent search committee. Uh, you can email me at J-E-A-W-A-L-1 at G-P-S-K-12. Uh, and we will, I will be taking those letters to the school committee and we will uh, choose the members that will be on the search committee. And tomorrow, we're having a meeting of the committee 
to discuss redrawing the districts for the schools. And so at nine o'clock, if you'd like to join that meeting, we will be meeting then. Thank you. And did we want to go with Amy? You're muted, but I suspect what you're going to say. Does anyone have any questions for Jean? I already said it. I didn't. I, wait, let me hold up my mug. You're on mute. That's what I'm saying. Sorry. Um, yes, any questions for Member Wall? Thank you. Okay, hearing none, we will uh, proceed with the agenda. Were there any other subcommittee reports? Don't so, rely on me to have a couple of list of anything. So you mentioned Jean discussing the superintendent search, or did I completely miss that because I was looking for something else? You did it. Okay, never mind. I'm paying attention. All Member good. Hollins is raising her hand or was raising her hand. Yeah, Member Hollins, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention there were two meetings I attended at the Collaborative for Educational Services in, based in Northampton. Um, went to a budget meeting and also their their main meeting. There were lots of topics, but the two I'd like to mention, they have a new grant program that's very extensive for early childhood. It's not just preschool, it's early childhood outreach zero to five and includes contacting parents, coaching, uh, mentoring, bringing people together. It's very good. They're serving some other school districts in Franklin County, not ours. So I would recommend we connect in with the program if we can. And the other is we have students from Greenfield that go to an alternative special ed sort of middle high school program. And it's far from us, the location. I'm aware that some schools have space and buildings not being used. So I've asked uh, because they're talking about the referrals there and their problem is lack of space that they considered a program in Franklin County, it would be helpful to us. We wouldn't have so much transportation. And they and the response from the chair was, if Greenfield had this interest, then the school committee would need to uh, let them know as a body they had that interest. So I just want to mention those two um, items that seem relevant to services for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hollins. Um, regarding the alternative school, looking for space, or, or, or ask, you asked about space in Franklin County. Um, do you have, if you have some information about it that the school committee would review, we can put it on the next agenda and um, move forward with that. Uh, and I would say the same thing about the early childhood grant um, okay. and, and our participation in that. Yeah, get us some information we can put in the packet and then we can put it on the agenda and discuss. Okay. Thank you for those uh, updates, very helpful. Any other subcommittee uh, reports? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So we will move into the um, FY22 budget update and discussion. Uh, Member Ekstrom, you want to start? Go ahead. I will. I also want to note that the mayor has joined us at this point. Just note. Thank her, you. Her, 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 her. Welcome, Mayor. Welcome, Mayor. Hello. All right. So, so we'll yes. the budget discussion. Go ahead. Let's get right into the budget discussion. Um, so we have been meeting, uh, we haven't had our meeting yet this week. We've met a couple of times. We went, met last week and we met week prior. Um, we, as, as we've said before, FY22 is something of a moving target. And so we're gathering information um, and also talking about, is it, is there, um, the way that things are organized, is that the way we'd like to see them? For example, um, and I'm bringing this because we did a vote on, amongst ourselves to bring forward to the school committee, um, a discussion about formalizing a curriculum office in Susan Hollins. This, I'm sure that you will join in and I'm, and I'm willing to let you join in on this, I think. And uh, so that there is a curriculum officer that would be doing more, or not, I, I don't wanna say officer, there is a person who would be overseeing curriculum and that would be inclusive of um, purchasing, researching, 
all the other material, all the other activities that would go with that, as long as, as well as the budgetary process and would have a better idea about where funding is coming from and where it's going. Um, and we do have a line item in the, in the budget for a curriculum person. And so it's worth visiting. And I think even if we had to put money into something like that, based, I think in the long run, if we're, if we're just talking about budgeting, in the long run, we would probably save funds because we would have more centralized person who's in charge of, who's overseeing it. Um, so I think it's sort of, it, it seems to make sense to me and I'm bringing that recommendation forward. Member Hollins, would you like to speak more on that? I might be able to clarify it a little bit. Um, historically, Greenfield's always had a, a physical curriculum office as well as someone in it or a couple of people in it. And even if the people changed, the office was there with all the curriculum materials, the assessment materials, the grant functions that have curriculum goals that was part of what happened in the, you know, curriculum office is really no different. We have a business office. There's a number of different functions related to business and the people are together. Um, it is really just taking some line items in the budget and putting them together and to see curriculum assessment grants that uh, support uh, teaching all in one uh, expense center in the budget and maybe considering a part-time secretary so that even if the leadership changes, uh, the whole process of professional development for teachers, uh, that it hangs together and it's not just pieces all, uh, that don't that aren't coordinated. And um, I was supporting two new line items in the budget, uh, plus some adjustments. We did get follow-up information on educational technology. That's all the software that's used, not to run the district, not virus protection, but the software we use for teachers and trying to get a list of what are those programs so we know what the amount is that is our total expense, which is over $100,000. There are some offsets we, we don't know yet, but it's really important to know what that amount is so we can budget for that. And I was hoping that we would have an instructional technology line item. It's very apparent this year because we're using so much uh, virtual uh, software, but we always have had, or there, regardless of always, there, there is a certain amount of membership that we have to sustain for teachers. And the second line item I am recommending is specific to kindergarten to grade three, which is elementary literacy. Um, it isn't really textbooks because at that level, children aren't using textbooks, but there's a per student cost for the materials every single teacher needs for every single student, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that we know what that is. I think it's a large number and we have it in the budget specifically um, so it doesn't get lost in the scheme of a large organization. And we know that every year literacy for children is our priority. And Andy's being really helpful um, working with administrators to bring in some clarity on those two items, what the amounts are and where it's being paid from. And we've just talked about, it's not just people, it's just coordinating the functions in our budget. So whoever's on the school, whomever's on the school committee can see what the whole education program is here in one expense center. Um, that's what we're talking about. And Andy's providing the backup information, as is Carol Holtzberg and some teachers and administrators, which is really helpful. Um, we have also been talking about Lana. Wait, please push oh. up, and maybe I won't echo. Thank you. Um, we've also been no. Hold on. Go ahead. I just would say there was one other line item I thought was important for us to consider, and that's to, I mean, each year we have certain things that are priorities, whether it's civics, education, racial justice, turnaround plan for school. We do have priorities that we should have a line item in our budget for our priorities in any year. So there's some money there to address these things that are really important to us as a committee. That's it. Okay, so let's come back. Um, we have also been, I do want to talk to you a little bit about COVID funding and, and fundings that, that we have received in response to things that need to be undertaken in response to COVID. Um, those are called ESSER funds. And right now the district has, it, I could be wrong, 
but it's at at the very least it's four hundred thousand that is still uh, still able to be used from those funds regard related to COVID specific items, purchases, whatever it may be. Um, it, at most, it's four hundred and forty thousand. I'm getting the numbers confused in my head. Um, and for next year, what we have been told, sort of preliminary from the state, is that it would be one point eight million would be in the same bucket. Um, and so that everyone is wondering, well, heck, let's go out and spend all of that. There are actually some very specific parameters around which we can spend the funding. Um, for example, if we wanted to buy a bunch of HEPA filters for our rooms, um, if we wanted to, I, you know, were there extra computers that needed to be purchased specifically? Is there additional PPE that needs to be purchased? Things like that. Um, and we do have extra funding that we are able to access. Um, and so the flip side of that being, why couldn't we use that funding for transportation? And the answer being, if thinking about it, my own way of viewing transportation or as, as it is determined with us, with, with the school committee and things like that, some of that is not accessible for that. There are very specific things that that money can be used for. Um, and I'm hoping perhaps that I've discussed that to death. Um, we're also looking at FY22, and again, this is a moving target. We have, we have asked, and Andy has asked the principals to work on their individual budgets, which will be coming to us, and we will be reviewing and, and seeing where we are at the sort of end point. Um, and to explain that process, what happens is Andy reaches out, says, can you bring us our budgets? Bring, us, bring your budgets to me. People turn in their budgets. Andy goes through them. The budget subcommittee will also go through them. The budgets that we have asked for this year aren't exactly wish list items. They are, okay, what do you need? And then regardless, not I don't want to say regardless, but we can't pie in the sky this, but it, it needs to be an accurate reflection of the things that we need for the school districts. And so that is what it will be. And I have no doubts that there will be things that, that I don't want to say cut, but certainly wouldn't be included this year. What they are, I don't know because we haven't looked at the budgets, but I expect that that will happen. Um, those meetings should be coming shortly and budget has a fun filled meeting tomorrow at 1030 if everyone's in excited. What else can I <laughs> share with everyone? That, that, was, that was a great update. Thank you. I do have a question about the timeline uh, sure. for the FY22 budget. We have a target date for publishing that um coming up is that correct do you, do you yeah. have that date and i know the mayor probably has that date memorized. mayor absolutely has it and i'm gonna let her share that i have it too i'm just uh so well but andy that's so awesome. too as well but i'm just trying trying to find it out i was looking through all the all the windows like i don't see andy i don't see andy <laughs> incognito. it's a race oh. between the mayor and me go ahead and if the mayor has it go I, I want. I want to say that it's maybe. Um, could it be the end of next week? Could it be the next? Yes, week? it could be. It's very soon. Yes, it yeah, is. I think it. I believe I it's, it's February eighteenth. Eighteenth. Oh, may, wait! Mayor's waving. You're on mute. Go ahead, Mayor There you go. No need, no need for the coffee cup. Um, the deadline for the school committee to publish their budget hearing is February 17th. Okay, so that's, so that's a week from today. Um, Seems yeah. like it. You have a yeah. you have a second you have a second deadline. Yep. February uh, Fe February 24th through March 3rd. Your date range for school department hearing on the budget, uh, and then. Our budget vote is March 10th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the hearing by the 3rd of March is what you're saying. Um, I'm not that good at calculating because I don't have a calendar in front of me, but something like yes. that. Yeah, I think you get yeah, March 3rd, yeah, March 3rd is your outside okay. day. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and your budget vote date, can you give me that again, the last date? March 10th. Okay. Um, so, 
Susan, and I should work with Andy to make sure we get that published next week. Um, any other questions uh, or discussion items for the FY22 budget? Uh, this is and Karen, go ahead. <laughs> and then me. <laughs> uh, Mayor, you can go first if you want. No, no, go right ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if this is the right place to talk about this. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very, very much to Andy and our uh, grants manager, um, Chris. I made a very last minute request for some information yesterday about the budget, but it would actually be last year's budget about what grants we had applied for and received based on uh, because of coronavirus. And I asked because our I've constantly been getting this question and seeing people try to indicate that they think we haven't applied for any or gotten any money or any of that. Um, and I will honestly admit I'm not great at reading spreadsheets, Andy. So, um, but I was hoping if you could just give me like a two, two minute, two line summary about um, what we've received. Are we in a good place with it? We've, uh, we've clearly from the spreadsheet I received re applied for a lot. Um, and I just want to, you know, put the public at rest that we, you guys are working all of the time to get us as much money as we can to get us through this phase. So I would appreciate if you could just kind of give me a minute, uh, like a quick little synopsis. Anybody who that means? Thank you. Uh, sure, I can. Uh, am I on? Yeah, mute? go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. So, yeah, yeah. So we have... Uh, received related to the coronavirus uh there are funds for technology there is a remote technology grant that had to be spent and already spent which you've already spent <laughs> those funds by <laughs> um that amount i'm just trying to find it while we're talking here but uh it estimates was, are fine it doesn't yeah um well let me go to the easier ones the coronavirus relief fund uh, that one, we received three, let me go even step back further, three grants. There's the ESER one grant, there's a coronavirus relief fund, and then there's a remote technology grant. Those are what it is that uh, the, the districts across the state have received. Some didn't receive the remote technology, but we did. Um, and so for those grants, the remote technology was clearly stating the obvious what it was for. Uh, it was for things like uh, promoting uh, and uh, supporting with uh, uh, remote technology for districts and especially in rural areas uh, such as Greenfield. So we ended up uh, getting that grant and then there's the, that one had to be spent by uh, I want to say August 31st. So we've spent all that. There's no worry about that. Um, the next grant we received was the uh, the first ESER. That ESER grant was $472,299. That is part of what it is that we have done currently. And that was geared towards PPE. Uh, some of the positions that we've talked about that are increased due to COVID related. The district and then in their re-entry team had developed a plan so the ESER funds were used for those that planning uh we we will be accessing all of it but the good news about that is as uh we like to say the best laid plans but plans change so we are allowed to carry those funds over and they those are due to be spent by december fy22 the third round are ESER funds it's the second round, ESER 2, and that's the $1.8 million that just came out from the December federal actions that took place with the new administration. Those funds are similar thing needs to be done where there needs to be a needs assessment, um, and which we will do and can also be used for similar things of positions related to the reentry and of students back into the school, uh, PPE if need be, technology, what have you. And that one though, again, we need to do a needs assessment to uh, determine uh, how it is that we best will use those funds. So those are the three uh, in particular. And then the coronavirus relief funding, that one was specifically 
uh, had to be done. I'm just trying to find here. Oh, here we go. Um, my apologies. Just uh, so many. I too have so many spreadsheets. <laughs> here we go. That funding for Greenfield was. $422,550, and we have spent that already. In addition to all these direct school funding uh -huh. sources, I would be remiss if I didn't, I'll say, acknowledge and state that the city also received CARES funding, and in working with the city finance department, Ms. Gilman and her staff, uh, there were funds that, because of the restrictions that were put on what the city could use them for, uh, the city did help support the schools for FY, the end of FY21 and into FY22 with some of their uh, their CARES Act funding. Uh, off the top of my head, I can say at least $250,000 worth. Uh, Might have even been a little more. I know at least there was some devoted to the first round of Chromebook purchases uh, that we submitted to the city and whether or not they went through the CARES or their accessing of uh, the, the FEMA reimbursement as well. So, so if there's anything I can do to allay fears are, yes, we are accessing the funds. We are using the funds in accordance with uh, allowable expenditures and programs. And uh, as the programs and operations change, we are changing accordingly so that we can maximize the dollars and help out as we re-enter and bring the kids back. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, that really helped me and I'm certain people who are listening. Um, it's, it's such a difficult thing to keep up with if you're not really sure of how it all works. So it's really important to hear it every now and then again. So I really appreciate it. And I really can't say thank you enough for getting that information together for me so fast. I knew when I sent it that I was asking a lot. So I really appreciate it. I won't take all the credit. That was Miss Nozell who uh, compiled it, but I'll take some <laughs> of the credit. Uh, you're oh, welcome. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you both for that, um, Katie, for asking for uh, uh, the information, and Andy and Chris for putting it together. And I will also reiterate what uh, Member Karen said. We get tons of questions about grant funding. And um, yes, we apply. We have a full-time grant writer. That's Chris Nozell that works for the district. And we are constantly looking for opportunities and applying for grant opportunities. And it's important for people to recognize that grants are limited to very specific purchases, so they don't add to necessarily the bottom line for the district, but they are an opportunity um, to expand programming, uh, to supplement programming, supplement um, purchases uh, due to various needs like a pandemic. Um, so I appreciate all of that. And I know uh, Mayor Wiedegardner has been waiting patiently to go next. Please go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I do have several questions uh, with regard to this uh, report. And I'll start with um, what Andy just said. Um, I wonder, Andy, if you can tell us how, I think it may have been one of the numbers that was thrown around this evening, but I'm not sure. How much of the ESSER 1 funds have been spent to date? And, and if you have it and can locate it, uh, what's left? And yeah. I guess... Uh, relative to ESSER, um, have we, I, I was given to understand that the ESSER 2 grant applications would be open by last Friday. Now, they did say in typical fashion on or around. <laughs> so maybe that hasn't happened, but I assume there's a plan to apply for that 1.8 million. It does require documentation on how we're going to spend it. Correct. And uh, yes, the ESSER 2 grant application, we have received notification. Uh, the application is available. Um, so again, once the um, the needs assessments are, are completed, uh, mm -hmm. we will be doing those, uh, those applications and applying for it. Yeah. Uh, so regarding what's available in ESSER 1, the first round of ESSER, we currently have available 
$432,446. Oh, okay. Okay. And then, uh, as I said, the coronavirus relief fund, that is fully expended as is, or let me say fully committed. They did, the coronavirus relief funding was originally supposed to be spent in completion and committed by December 31st of 2020, right. but they have extended that. Uh, so we have right now uncommitted $44,974 of that grant. Um, and as I said, the remote technology grant, that's been fully expended. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have available. Good. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Uh, a different question, uh, not related to grants for that, but it's good to see that, that that's um, going to be available for us as we go forward. And hopefully as we go forward with a, um, a reopening plan. Um, so uh, other questions going back <laughs> to hours ago now um, with um, the curriculum officer, uh, the two new line items, et cetera, et cetera. Are you, uh, Member Hollins, are you suggesting that that be put into the FY22? That is the way I heard it, but I, I wasn't sure if that was for, um, you know, this, this coming FY22 uh, budget or one in the future. We had a long talk about this at the budget committee meeting and I was able to persuade my colleagues that it was really a great time right now to organize our budget for 2022 with a focus on curriculum and instruction so all the money is in in one place that anyone can understand what we have to spend for instruction and professional development. It, it means adding three line items, which Andy says doesn't take very much time. And the money, the money, it the money is so money. Right? Well, but uh, we have money in the budget. It's just it's not always clear where it is. And um, I think this would help clarify and make sure we do have money for essentials for instruction. So, yes, I, unless someone objects, I'm hoping we can organize for 22 that way. Can I make a comment on that? Please. Uh, yeah, I don't have any other questions, so fine. Um, so the curriculum, we we do have a position for a curriculum director in the in the budget currently, and it's that person hasn't been hired, so I wouldn't say the money isn't there, but we do have it in the current budget, um, mm -hmm. and so essentially this would be carrying it over to the next budget, but actually filling the position. Mm -hmm. Good. And we have, we have, uh, and in speaking with administrative assistance or about administrative assistance, we do have openings and those are in the current budget and they just are not filled. So we aren't creating any positions by doing this. We're just actually fulfilling the ones that we have there already. If I could continue, uh, that, that number that you put out, the $100,000 for the curriculum office, is that in total? That is a curriculum director and some version of an, ad, an assistant to help. A number, if I could answer, we already have a full budget uh, with curriculum lines. So this isn't, this is just putting them all in one place. Okay. But right. um, the one thing that, would be different is clarifying what we need for instructional software. I mean, it's in, we're spending for it now, but who knows what it's for and where it is. And it's, if you don't know, it's pretty easy to leave it out. So to just make it more articulate in the budget, really. Yeah. And if I could. I do see, oh, Mayor Wiedegartner, did you have more comments? Oh, the only thing I was going to say, apropos of Andy's uh, comment about CARES funding, it was significantly more than $200,000. But I, I don't, no number. doubt. I, do, I just <laughs> didn't want to, I didn't want to <laughs> overshoot or, so I figured yeah. I'd underpromise. Uh, <laughs> uh, the money, money that the citizen, the, the city provided through the CARES Act funding to the school. Yes. Thank you. Um, just you had asked me to help keep this conversation on track and I have to be honest I don't know if it's on track or not <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, I feel like it's on track in terms of getting questions answered about the budget I'm I'm, I'm feeling okay with where it is uh, right this second 
Um, uh, it looks like Member Hollins has at least another question, um, and then we'll see if we can move on or if we need to make a motion. But thank you for that. Member Hollins, go ahead. In, in relation to all the discussion about the new grant money coming in for the schools and the need for a needs assessment and how that integrates with planning next year's budget, I understand a couple surrounding districts have done a survey of their high school. So we could consider something like a survey of middle high school students, whether they're struggling, need help, feel depressed. And I believe this money can be used. I'm not an authority on this, but I believe it can be used for, for counseling, for tutoring. So it may not need to take, we have a lot of teachers listening. It may not need to take a really long time to do a very simple survey of our students uh, to collect some data on the needs that everybody's talking about and use the money that way. That's uh, my comment. Thank you, Uh Any other comments, questions regarding FY22 budget from the school committee members? And Andy, oh, Member Ekstrom, go ahead. Uh, I do want to, however, the, the mayor has asked that everyone put forward a is a flat budget level funded level funded sorry it's a visual in my head which means essentially it would be the same as last year's but adjusted for increases of contractual arrangement and that would be all so, the, mm -hmm. so that everyone knows sort of where we're starting and what has been requested by the mayor may, may i clarify that is that that's to me is le level service level funded would be the 16-7 1080. Uh, you're talking, right. If, I mean, it, you're correct. It, it, I said level funded, but there are increases, obviously, yeah, because of contractual. Right. And so the difference okay, between just, the two, so, yeah, so people yeah. know is that level funded is the exact same amount of money as the year before. Level no. services accommodating for um, any increases in costs on the same items. No change in uh, features of the budget, but same, right. yeah. Yes, okay. that is correct. Andy, you were gonna add something else, Andy, go ahead. No, no, that was it. Okay. Uh, just... And any for everyone, and, and to quell everyone's concern, why don't these people know this term? It actually gets, they get interchanged quite a bit in conversations. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anything else about budget? Okay, so uh, I think we're in a good place on that and we can move on to the next item in the agenda. I appreciate uh, all the work and questions on that. And MCAS discussion is the next item. Uh, I know, Glenn, you have the resolution. I did want to, and I put in the packet um, a couple of items that people are gonna need to be patient with me. Um, so related to the MCAS, um, what I did to get ready for this meeting was I uh, contacted uh, Brian Rossman, who is in uh, Senator Joe Comerford's office, who's the legislative director there. Uh, and I know that uh, Senator Comerford, who's our Senator for Greenfield, has been very active in uh, the, the um, leadership fight around MCAS and what's appropriate for students. Um, and I did put a couple of things in the packet. The first thing is the most recent communication from the commissioner uh, of DESE, Jeff Riley, which is dated January 5th, so it's a, about a month old, related to uh, MCAS and other testing. And that's in the packet just for folks to reference um, and see how the, the state department the, that manages uh, school districts uh, is, is considering MCAS and their opinion on it. Um, and then also in there um, is a bill that is put, has been put forward by uh, Senator Comerford in the current legislative session in Boston. Um, let me get to the right spot here so I can explain this. It is Bill SD409. I put the whole thing in the packet because it isn't long. It's an act expanding opportunities to demonstrate academic achievement. Basically is, is asking the state to take some very specific te uh, steps to move away from standardized testing as the only measure of a student's achievement. Um, something that uh, in my world, in my real job of higher education, we talk about all the time 
uh, which is called multiple pathways. So multiple pathways to the same degree, um, the same um, associate's degree or bachelor's degree in a higher ed setting, multiple pathways to show competence in high school um, is, is what we're talking about here and the, the bill that she has introduced. Um, I think it's important to have a sense of what's going on statewide so that we can, um, as citizens, advocate for um, our own opinions. We all are going to see this in a different way and have different ways of acting. Um, so that information is all in here. There is um, an update as well that I did not put in the packet, um, but you can find the um, update from the state on dates for testing. MCAS is currently scheduled for spring of 2021, um, and that information um, can be accessed on the state's website um, just by looking for the student assessment update from DESE, D-E-F-E. Uh, and that's the information I put in there. And then the, the other item in uh, the materials for tonight in the packet is uh, the resolution that was referenced by several folks in public comment. Um, and uh, uh, Secretary Johnson Moussad has um, had his subcommittee discuss. And so I'll turn it over now uh, to him to talk about uh, and make a motion around the, the resolution. Okay, I'm just gonna um, read the motion. Move that the Greenfield School Committee vote to support resolution number one, MCAS and high stakes testing, which was approved by the delegates to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees by a vote of 112 to nine with two abstentions at the MASC annual meeting on November 7th. I further move that we inform Governor Charlie Baker, Education Secretary Jeffrey Riley, and our state legislative delegation, Senator Joe Comerford and Representative Paul Mark, of our position in favor of canceling the MCAS test this year. The resolution reads as follows. Resolution 1, MCAS and high stakes testing submitted by the MASC Board of Directors. Be it resolved that MASC rejects the calls for the students of 2022 who missed their 10th grade MCAS testing to be required to make it up in the 2020-2021 in the 2020-2021 school year or ever. We demand that those students be held harmless for not taking the MCAS and that their graduation requirements shall be determined by locally controlled voices of the school committee and school administration within the remaining graduation requirements of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Additionally, we reiterate our call for a moratorium on all high stakes testing for the 2020-2021 school year, so all students can benefit from their time being focused on direct instruction. And we urge the legislature to enact a moratorium on high stakes testing for three years. Thank you, Secretary Johnson, we saw that's the motion. Do I have a second for that motion? Second by Ekstrom. Okay, and let's discuss. Just for anyone who doesn't know what MASC stands for, it's Massachusetts Association of School Committees. That's all. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mayor Whitaker. Oh, please go ahead, Mayor Whitaker. I, I like the resolution. Um, I'm prepared to support it. Um, uh, it does obviously require the other item on the agenda, which is, uh, well, actually it's not on the agenda, but it does uh, require us to be able to have some administrative leadership at the top of the office in order to make this all happen. So um, I, I'm hoping that we will get to that, uh, to, to that place, but I'm prepared to support this because I think it's really important. And I particularly like the um, I particularly like the three year extension. Um, so um, as long as we have someone who can direct this um, motion at the top of the uh, at you know in our leadership, then I'm I'm good with this. I know we're working on it. I'm not suggesting we're not. I'm just saying it's. It, it, is, it is dependent upon having a superintendent or an interim superintendent or all of the above. 
The actual motion was revised to not refer to uh, um, the superintendent to uh, I understand. the action. So mm -hmm. um, we could designate someone among ourselves to relay the sense of the committee. Thank you, Secretary Johnson. We said, and uh, Vice Chair Ekstrom, go ahead. Um, I actually just wanted to talk about the MCAS just sort of in general. As just in my own world, I don't feel like the MCAS is, is an appropriate test to be forced to take. Um, if And this harkened back all the way to the 1900s. I recall testing, but it was achievement testing, and it was based, the, the intention was to see where you were and what, what it was that you needed to be more successful with your education. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, that has been lost. And so this isn't so this isn't so much Howard in my head isn't so much as how are your students doing as opposed to what are the, what are the schools not doing and that is not what this should be about and that shouldn't be tested in in my very own opinion um, I, I but I do also want to say that the um, state has said that they would like the test to be administered but that they won't be relevant to anything basically this year in part because it's not going to be a true reflection of anything other than how poorly the year has gone. And if they had to meet the um, requirements of the response, the response by the state based on the scores, the state wouldn't be able to afford to do all of those things in my opinion. And so, do, do I think we should take the test? Absolutely not. I also think that if it did happen, it couldn't be used as a as a piece to discourage someone or keep someone from graduating. That's all. This is Member Karen. Member Karen, go ahead, and then Secretary Johnson is done. I, I hear um, what Member Ekstrom is saying, but I guess I go back to the point of if it doesn't mean anything, then why are we doing it? <laughs> I just, the, these, the, never mind the figuring out how to get them all to a building to test. Never mind how to work that out, how to have staff, how to have proctors, how to keep everybody safe. The money and time spent doing that is just not worth it if it doesn't even mean anything. I, what What is, and to be very clear, I am opposed to the MCAS in general, just for the exact reason that member Ekstrom said. It used to be about figuring out where we were so we could round out our education. And now it's held as a standard that yeah. you can't live up to in different parts of the state based on how rural you are. You can't take a district that's uh, at a different level and compare them, a Western Mass district to the Eastern half of the state and expect them to perform exactly the same. They have access to different things our students don't. And we have access to things they may not. It's a completely ridiculous statement. I mean, I took all those Iowa tests, those CAT tests, and they were terrible. <laughs> but they didn't mean anything to me, as Doug Selwyn pointed out tonight. They didn't mean anything to me. I was a middle class white child of privilege. So I took it, I was annoyed about it, and I moved on. But for a lot of students, Never mind in Greenfield, but just in general, it's a source of stress and trauma that we just don't need to add to right now. Um, I'm in support of this, and I'm in support of continuing to figure out ways to change the whole way we do this in, in the for, at all, in general. This is, just feels like a step forward to changing the way the state looks at these at all for me, but that's me. Thank you, Member Karen. I, I think it was Member Johnson we said. Yes, yeah, just, just to say that um, I think one of the things that the tests have measured most effectively is the disproportionate negative impact of, of, of um, the way that resources are allocated in our school systems. Um, and so essentially it's measuring how poor um, and how uh, and whether the student is, is you know, not part of the dominant culture and therefore disadvantaged in taking the test. And there's also a, a financial element too, where the testing companies are actually, you know, making substantial sums of money um, from uh, the school, from the state, while making submitting our students to education that isn't appropriate based on teaching to a test that doesn't do anything. So I think, you know, but the, and I think that one thing that 
the pandemic has done is shine light on disparities all over the place. So we're having this conversation in part because of the pandemic has just made something that was already unfair, just, uh, just so horribly unfair to if we were to do it now. Um, I hope that the conversation does continue past the past the pandemic towards getting rid of this altogether. Mm -hmm. Other comments from school committee members? Hollins? Member Hollins, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm going to support this for, for lots of reasons. Someday maybe we could have a long discussion about different models of testing and what's useful and what's not in schools. And But what I want to say is, um, in addition to supporting this for all the reasons that have been mentioned, it is really important in addition that we all be accountable for what what students are learning and to make sure what they're learning is what we think is relevant and to have some way of of knowing that and that's why i support putting all our money having a coordinated curriculum office because assessment would be part of that and it would be racially unbiased and helpful to teachers so all of this discussion supports having a unified curriculum office with all uh, also accountability measures that teachers support. Thank you, Member Hollins. I, I'm going to remind the public again, there is no using of the chat function during the school committee meeting. Um, it's only for signing up for public comment. Other discussions, questions from school committee members? I'm not hearing any. I think we move to a vote on the resolution. Uh, Secretary Johnson Musab. Let me unmute myself. Member Karen. Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom. Yes. Member Hollins. Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad. I'm a yes. Chair Proietti. Yes. Member Wall. Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner. Didn't hear it. <laughs> yes. Oh. Is there, okay. The motion okay. carries unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you all for that. And thank you for that discussion. And um, not to put you on the spot, Secretary Johnson, Musab, but I think you did offer to communicate to the uh, elected officials that are on the resolution that we did pass it. Is that something we can charge you with? Yes, and I'll, I'll copy the full school committee when I send that email. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, item seven on the agenda, which is in-person learning update and discussion. Um, I want to start with just a, a couple of things um, that are kind of top of mind for me. Um, I did forgo my chair's report because I had um, some thoughts around around this item. Um, and I just quickly, well, I want to mention that um, we appreciate everything that uh, folks are saying and the, the push from the public to go back to uh, in-person learning and as quickly as possible. And yesterday we did receive, um, and I want to acknowledge the school committee, um, I believe the mayor uh, and the mayor's office, other city leadership, um, and the uh, teachers union were provided with a copy of the petition that had been circulated in the community um, asking for us to uh, move to an uh, in-person model, um, giving a date in late April. Um, and I want to just acknowledge that we have, um, we've received that and um, we appreciate the engagement on the community of the community and in, in, in what was clearly a very, very important thing and that is uh, getting our students back to um, into into the schools. So let's um, let's start with a motion. I'm sorry, I'm just looking over my notes here before we move into the motion piece. Okay, so I think let's start with a motion along the lines of uh, moving to authorize the superintendent and district leadership to begin preparation for implementation of a hybrid style learning model in April of 2021. 
we can start there. Remember, emotions can fail if that's not what folks are looking for. Um, but we can start with that and see where it gets us. Do I have, do I have a motion? So, so moved. Who was that? Was that member Karen? Yes. And a second, second, please. Member Wall with the second. Thank you. And let's discuss. This is member Karen. Please go ahead, member Karen. Um, I thought maybe it would be good for me to speak a little bit about uh, the great team and where we were and what we would typically be doing as the next phase. Um, I guess I also I do also want to reiterate what um, chair said about I really do appreciate civic engagement at all levels all the time. It's such a you know a wonderful way to show people that you are involved more than just um, it's just a great way. I was really appreciative of the movement and it was I thought it was a good way to engage the public anyway. So typically we would, the plan of the great team would be to move into phase three at this time, or actually, and none of the phases that we have really called for what I think parents specifically in that model were asking for in the petition, I should say, which is an in-person learning with your teacher. So to back all that up, um, Phase three was to include elements, which is a program prioritizing students in grades pre-K through four for in-person services delivered in a socially distant outdoor setting. Clearly from that description, we had expected this would happen sooner. That also included streams available at the high school and the middle school and is allowed a number of students to access live remote content while being supervised. That meant that they weren't necessarily there with their English teacher, but they were being supervised. Then we would have moved into phase four. And if we were to continue following the original plan, this is where I would suggest we move next. Because all that does is actually include one more program called Early Essentials. And that's available for kindergarten and maybe up to two. And that again becomes supervised remote learning. The children are at school with teachers, but it's not specifically their second grade teacher or their first grade teacher. That is students in a classroom learning on their computers with supervision from a paraprofessional. It could be a teacher, it could not. They would still have lunch at their desks in a classroom and they would still have some form of outdoor play. So I just wanted to clarify that first. The other, the thing that people I think want in this petition is that they're looking for more of a true hybrid. And I think that there is some confusion about what it means when people say, and I don't like the word confusion, but I'm gonna go with it. Um, when they say, oh, well, uh, such and such a school is back in person or such and such a school is back in person. There are three ways the districts around us and across the state are running a hybrid program. They are doing fully supervised remote learning. That means that the children go in, they are not necessarily in a second grade classroom, they're not necessarily with second graders, they're in pods that make sense based on sibling groups or friend groups or sports groups or things like that. They are supervised by a paraprofessional or a teacher or a building monitor and they have access to teachers if they need it. They are more accessible to mental health services because we can see them and be them. But that doesn't mean that their second grade teacher is teaching them. They still are on screens almost the entire day and all of that. That's, that's a full supervised remote plan. Then there's a hybrid plan where a teacher teaches them live on their school day, but only the children in the building. And the children who are not in the building are at home doing work with no live instruction. So it's assignments that have been passed out, they log into their Seesaw or their Google Classroom and they're there. That kind of puts parents back on even a more way than they are now because there's no live check-in with the teacher that day to say, yep, this is your reading group. Yep, you're on task. Yep, that's not happening. So they'd have two days where they're actually getting real live instruction and two days where they're on their own on a computer at home. And the other plan that's happening around us is teachers are running live classrooms and remote classrooms at the same time. And so on the days your kids are at, in the building, they're with their teacher and they are still using their Chromebook, but their teacher is in front of them. And in the days that they're home, they're on their Chromebook at home. 
and it's still a live class, even though they're not in person. So I think if we're going to move forward with trying to create a hybrid plan, and maybe that all falls out in negotiations, I'm not sure. But I think we all need to know what we're talking about and what we're aiming for and what the goal is. Um, I think I spoke enough for a minute. <laughs> I do believe the kids should go back more of a hybrid plan. I think we can make it happen. I think we can do it safely. I think especially with the date of April something, we are moving towards a place where we can be ready and safe. But I also think we have a lot of work to get there. And a lot of the work has to be done, boots on the ground, working together to get it done. Member Karen, thank you very much. I do think this might be a record that you've talked in this meeting more than any other um, so far this this year. Um, I appreciate I'm a better it. listener than talker. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent summary. Thank you. Um, other comments from the, the school committee? Yes, Ekstrom. Ah, Mr. Ekstrom, please go ahead. So, Katie, when you said a hybrid plan, which one do you think is more plausible, given what you just described as the variance of hybrid plan? That is a really difficult question. Um, <laughs> I think at, that's a different answer for each age group. And here's why. I think at a high school level, first of all, because they're changing classrooms all the time, say they don't, because of the way we started this year, we do have some extra challenges. So we didn't start the English class a ninth grade English is a cohort with ninth grade history and ninth grade algebra. They don't have the same kids in every class. So that makes it that if we were to rotate classrooms and change, now we have a larger quarantine group. And I don't necessarily mean spread group, although it could be, We, but the science does mostly back that schools are not a transmissional place. But that's a difficult problem, right? Because if say my son Jackson had English with four kids but then history with five other kids and then he had a close had had covid positive now we have nine kids so at the high school level i think a truly supervised remote learning process is probably the easiest the most doable and makes the most sense at your middle school grades of sixth and seventh grade i think that that can continue and make the most sense because those kids have done the middle school thing they're also changing classes we did not create great cohorts for that either and they're able to, we can create time for them to get better mental health access and we can bring some of them back in if they're really, really struggling. Fifth grade, I don't think, I think we should sort of treat fifth grade academically as the younger grades because it's a transitional year and also they don't change classes quite the same way. And I think we could figure that out. I think that the parents think and need their kids to have teacher contact. I don't know how to make that happen safely without an unreasonable amount of work on the teachers. The teachers are just killing it. They're working so hard right now. I have no nothing negative to say about anybody doing the work on the ground every day. This is just an impossible situation. Um, I have seen wonderful suggestions from families that they think would work. For example, I saw one that the kindergarten through second grades could go to the high school because we need more space and the high schoolers would stay home. There are issues with that. For example, the toilets are not meant for teeny tiny kindergartners. <laughs> They're just not. Um, that seems like a silly thing, but when you're dealing with teeny tiny humans that should be able to use the restroom on their own but need an assist and now we have covid it's not as simple as that as we would love it to be because trust me i would love it to be um and then there seems to be a misnomer going around that all class a lot of classrooms have a additional teaching aid or a paraprofessional instructional assistant the only classrooms that definitely have one of those are kindergarten and so the, you know, the one of the suggestions is, well, the teacher runs the live stuff and the paraprofessional keeps the remote and they kind of work together, which would be an amazing plan. If we could figure that out, I would run with it. But I, I don't think we have the staff to make that happen. I don't know for sure. We'd have to crunch some numbers and figure it out. Um, it's a long winded answer to be like, I really wish we could all just go back to school in person tomorrow um but i think that that's not an answer we could necessarily decide on ourselves i think mm -hmm. we need to be talking in conjunction with our union and our administration and all of that i think we could make a goal 
yeah. and then go from there. Well, um, I, yeah, I mean, I would suggest actually that, that we just go to say, we want a hybrid plan. We uh, want to start it by this date. We need to figure it out right now. How's it work? What are we doing? Well, and there is another piece that plays into this, that we are now going to be doing pooled testing. And pooled testing is conducted that there's always a pool that is tested together. So they are essentially a pod. And that pod is a limited size of 10. And all those 10 people have to stay together throughout their day. So just, just to throw that in, in the event that there weren't enough obstacles, there's another one. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Although pool yeah. testing is good, that means we're having more testing, we can keep track, we're moving yes. through it quickly. It does yeah. make it difficult. And you know, there's other op problems with a hybrid plan too that people don't always think yeah. about. Like if, uh, if we offer a hybrid plan and families have been able to stay home because we're fully remote and they were able to collect unemployment or their employer was being, um, you know, helpful, as soon as they say, oh, your kid can go to school, what happens to those families that were relying on the situation as it was, right. you know, or um, what happens when some reason your kid gets a quarantine three times in one month? Because it could happen if your kid takes a bus and they get exposed on the bus and then they have to stay home for 10 days and they go back for two days and now someone in class has an exposure. So they go home for 10 days and they come back and they have another exposure on the playground and they have to go home for 10 days. Now we're at, you know, 30 days of being home and parents without work. And it's not as simple as we would all love it to be. Yeah. It's just not. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the remote learning was really important to get a good solid lead on. And it feels like we have a good, it's going well. The learning itself is going okay. The thing people are worried about is the kids' social and mental health for the most part, which is fair. And some kids are failing. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend they're not. Yeah. Um, but this is a really big piece, but it needs to happen quicker than we can make it. <laughs> I don't know how to change that statement, but we need to move this forward in a way that makes sense. And there have been crazy things that held us up that don't maybe aren't obvious to the public. For example, our lawyer passed away tragically in December. We can't do negotiations easily without a lawyer. So we have to continue to, we had to find a new representation. That's difficult, that's not easy. That's a huge cost for the district. We can't just pick one. We had to think about it and make a good decision. So I know that it feels like to a lot of our public that we're just sitting around and we don't care, <laughs> which breaks my heart. But I get why they feel that way and I get why they're angry and I get why they're frustrated. I am too we have to just keep moving forward. And that's, I don't have a clear path to it, but we can do this. I know we can. <laughs> Very well stated, Member Karen. Um, I do have two members I can see on my screen. I'll go with Member Ekstrom first and then uh, okay. Mayor Wiedegartner. No, let the mayor go. I've spoken a couple of times. <laughs> mayor Wiedegartner and then Member Ekstrom. I really appreciate Member Karen's uh, comments. I, I think that what parents are also interested in, yes, is uh, being able to have a teacher in the classroom, but they're also very interested in making sure that their kids are together with other kids. And so to the extent that we can create a hybrid model that um, given all the issues around doing that, uh, that allows us to have our children in their classrooms along with other children and interacting with them, I think is really, really important. Um, I've been referencing your July um, document. Uh, Maybe that has been thrown to the wind, but it's the, the public schools draft reopening plan. Yeah. And we do have a pretty um, well outlined plan for hybrid learning in that for all grades. So I'm wondering, uh, maybe member Karen can help us understand that. I'm wondering, is that, um, inadequate at this point or is it adequate to use as a baseline for how we might move forward? Member Karen, please go ahead and, and give your um, your comment if you would. Uh, 
opinion on that, if you would. You're on mute if you're talking. <laughs> to member Karen. <laughs> it, it, she may have stepped away for a second. Um, I do know, so I think we should use that plan as a baseline. And um, I did specifically ask member Karen to look at what the school districts in Franklin County around us were doing prior to this meeting. Um, that you're right that that plan does have some hybrid components to it. Um, mm -hmm. And the it's only slightly different because it does um, it prioritizes much much more exclusively. Maybe that's not the right word. It prioritizes much more. Let's say the students that um, need special intervention. Um, and so it, it may not be uh, exactly what we're looking for anymore. We didn't know in, in July and August what we know now, um, mm -hmm. not only about the virus, but also about what works and doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. So I do, I do think that we can use that as a, as a baseline. And I think that is kind of the intent is don't throw out what we've already put together, what the state has already approved and what does offer us steps for moving forward. Um, but I think it's also important to look at what else is out there and whether or not we can, we can um, adjust and implement components that we know may help us uh, now that uh, other districts have experienced them uh, differently. Um, and then to also reiterate the impact bargaining piece, with, that's the piece with the union. Um, we do have a second motion that we're gonna put forward uh, as a part of this discussion um, as well. So uh, yeah, I'll stop there and turn it over to Vice Chair Ekstrom for a comment. And which is a perfect segue to what it is that I was going to mention. So we have been involved in uh, mediated negotiations with the uh, MTA and GEA. For those who don't know, the MTA is the Massachusetts Teachers Association and the GEA is the Greenfield Education Association. Um, I think those two are, those, those titles are explan explanatory. Um, and, but there is something that we sort of come back to and also in moving towards hybrids and, and thinking about air circulation and things like that, we are, in, we are going to recommend and I'm going to make a motion that I move that we authorize up to $200,000 for the oh, purchase hold of- on. Hold off on the motion because we have a motion on the table already. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we were just talking. Sorry. Yep, that's okay. So, uh, um, yeah, we are going to take up that motion that's related to going back in hybrid and related to some of the things that we've been working on to reach agreement with the teachers union. Um, so the motion that is on the table currently is uh, a motion to authorize the superintendent and district leadership to begin preparation for implementation of a hybrid style learning model in April, 2021. So we'll take more comment if there is some on this, otherwise we can move to a vote. I'm not hearing any other comment from school committee members. Only a couple of you are on my screen, so you need to speak up if you want to make a comment. This right, is, so I, gonna, oh, go sorry, ahead, I got Karen. kicked out for a minute. It's okay. Um, uh, so there, was a, there was a question about from the mayor that perhaps you can answer better than I did. Um, okay. Our, the great plan, the implementation plan from the great team does yes. include those components you talked about, the um, streams and there was something else, yeah. a number of uh, different streams, that, elements and essentials. Yeah. Thank you. That are, that are really hybrid like. Yes. Um, yep. And would you suggest starting with that plan as a starting point or ha have you learned or have we learned enough to say we need a, a totally different plan? Um, that's a difficult question. The They are a hybrid plan, but it's truly supervised remote learning. That's what it is. And that would accomplish getting children out of the home with their peers, getting people able to go back to work more. I, I'm, I'm supportive. That's what we want to do. My concern is that we are not at a place that we have negotiated that yet. And if that takes a month to get there, and then we have to then again negotiate a different type of hybrid plan, that is a lot 
could delay a different kind of hybrid more. That is my only concern about it. But if all we're going to do is provide a true remote learning supervision service, that which is a fine option, it, get, it does cover a lot of the bases, um, then then we should just run with that plan. And that's, that's an option. Um, do you think that maybe that question gets a little bit into what really should be left up, up to the district administration rather than left up to the school committee? Yeah, I think that is an accurate representation of that. Um, That's yeah. how it feels like to me. We just don't, we're not the educators. We don't know enough to make right, decisions. Right, right. But, like, you know, the discussion can be heard and um, we can move from there with people who know better than we do. Can I make a 30 second clarifying Please. comment yep. about Absolutely. something I said earlier? Um, I just, I, I, in my conversation or a monologue for lack of a better word, I named a lot of the issues that we're facing and I don't think they should hold us back from moving forward at all. I just want the con the community seems to be unsure why we're not moving forward. So I was trying just to name some of the things that are holding us back. That is all we should be moving forward. We should be figuring it out. We should have been doing it a little faster. I, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying no, we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, these are the things we have to consider because we're not considering just our families at home. We're considering a district at a, as a whole. That's all. Thank Can you. I comment, please? Mayor Weedy Gardner. Weedy Gardner. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Katie, uh, Member Karen. I, I guess I'm I'm I I've moved beyond those pages in this report that you're talking about to pages later in the report models for in-person, hybrid, and remote learning. And I felt like there was some good information in there under the hybrid model that does specify each school and how we might make that happen. So rather than um, streams, elements, et cetera, I wonder if we aren't capable of focusing on that and moving forward. Okay, so I think the I think the only confusion here is, Mayor. I'm guessing you're looking at the plans that the old. three plans. It's old, too. The July. Three plans yeah, that a lot has changed in July, and yeah. what we did after that is we adopted one of those, which was Remote Plus. I understand. So, yeah, so we would we we could absolutely go back and look at those. We would need to just you know make sure that the um, that we're approving whatever is put into place but yes the, the, that information does exist you're absolutely right okay Hollins Other payments. Uh, member Hollins please go ahead first I'd like to thank Katie for all the work she's done on behalf of our committee uh, handling this I'm really appreciative that she has put so much depth of thinking in it secondly I'd like I'd like the idea of reviewing the plan in, when we wrote this plan, there were not hundreds of schools that had figured out how to have a hybrid with some children back in schools. But now there are districts around us that have figured it out. I'm not comfortable not looking at that. I think as a school committee, it is, it's a policy. I mean, I, I what we're hearing tonight is people are desperate to get back to in-person learning, some people. And if there are successful ways to do that, I'd like to know what they are and encourage us to pursue that for people who want to pursue that. I think that's important. But secondly, um, the first comment I ever made on this subject when the pandemic was announced, and I'll, it's still what I think, even when we go back to school, when we make that policy decision, there are going to be faculty, personnel, and there are going to be parents who do not want to, who can, faculty who cannot go in because of doctors issues, medical issues, and parents who are going to choose it. We're going to need to keep a virtual program uh, even when we go back. And I don't know if we know yet, I think I asked this a few months ago, how many, how many exclusions do we have for planning? How many parents would rather stay virtual <laughs> until this pandemic, everyone's vaccinated? And I have a question whether we can there's some way within the city we can prioritize uh, uh, school personnel for the vaccine when it's available. 
uh, to the extent that that might be a factor in getting our staff more comfortable going in or parents more comfortable. And lastly, I just want to say I've heard a couple of comments in the community annoyed with us because uh, the reason we're not moving to let children go back to school is because of money. And I said to them, I have never heard I have never heard that the reason this isn't happening is because of money. So I just wanted to say I'm not aware that that's one of the reasons I understand to be a reason. And I, I'd like, um, I really would like to, without too much delay, actually know what are districts doing that have moved to hybrid that has students back in school uh, uh, around us, there's some synchronous models where a teacher teaches a class and a few children are in school and the rest are out, but they're all getting the same instruction at the same time. And I just think this would be really interesting for us to know soon and then to go back, see what's possible and have a better sense in our own mind, how many parents really want this? Some really do, some really don't. I'd sure feel better figuring this out if I knew, because I don't think it's everyone, but it's certainly a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you, Member Holland. Other comments or questions related to this? I would like to move to a vote soon. Um, we've learned from our meetings in the past that two hours of public session, knowing when, knowing that we have to also do an executive session tonight, um, is about the limit of doing our best work um, in both pieces of the meeting. Um, so I would like to move to a vote unless there's any last comments on this. This is member Karen. I swear it'll be my last comment. <laughs> um, I did do some research and it's an appropriate thing to talk about finding out what the other districts are doing. Um, I do appreciate that. Um, I want to say that there's a goal I would shoot for, but I don't think it's fair to say it until we get on talking into with the teachers. I also think that I would like to do a survey of families. I think that that's not a horrible thing to do. I think it would be useful. I would volunteer to set it up and work with the technical director to figure out how to do it. I think there's to some extent, we can't know exactly what we need until we know what families want. If only a third of the district wants to come back to any sort of in-person learning, that does change our approach a little bit. Um, anyway, I just, and also, can someone reread the motion? Because I keep getting kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. So I've sort of Thank lost it in all of my on I'm on all night rambling. Could I? Uh, very quickly, please. Yes, it, it will be extremely quickly. I understand completely that vaccinations are going to be an issue when we start really talking about this. Um, in out of theory, out of what we'd like to plan to do, what the plan's gonna be, what what are we gonna do on the ground? And I just want you to know that this is phase two. We are doing very successfully our um, vaccinations uh, here in Greenfield. I personally am going to make it a priority, however I can, to get Greenfield teachers vaccinated as fast as they can. Um, so, and, we're doing good work over there. And I just want people to understand that we have the ear of the state and I will do everything I can to make sure that our, our teachers are at the priority level when the time comes. We are in phase two, they are part of phase two. I'm hoping that we can begin to move them forward. Thank you very much, Mayor Rita Gardner. Mm -hmm. Let's move to a vote on this. Member we Karen? Read, oh, we reread it. We read it. Um, I have it right in front of me. Hang on. A uh, motion to authorize the superintendent and district leadership to begin preparation for implementation of a hybrid style learning model in April 2021. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson? The most. Oh, I think you froze. Um, I think she's frozen. So, Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Um, Chair Pretty, are you back with us? Yes. Uh, you voted yes? Okay. I'm voting yes. Well, 
The motion carries unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you all. There is one more motion we would like to make tonight related to this. Um, let me find it. Oh, sorry. I'll find it. I've got, I've got it, it. Right here. Oh, go ahead, Glenn, if you've got it, please. Okay, I'll make it and then we can discuss. You might not, people might not understand why we're making this, but then we can describe as well yeah. as we can. Um, I move that we authorize up to $200,000 for the purchase of air purifiers as needed to move toward a hybrid style learning model. Second by Second, Second by Okay, Go ahead. you just want to give us a quick overview or do you want me to? Either one's fine. Yeah, um, it looks like um, it will be reassuring to teachers and perhaps to the community as well if we uh, have air purifiers because um, you some people may wish that we could just install very, very high quality um, filters into our HVAC systems, but in fact, some of those systems are old enough that installing those filters uh, is just not compatible with the with the way those were designed to work. Um, and so, as a supplement to try to, you know, the, we understand that the most important measures to be taken in the schools with regards to preventing um, infection is going to be um, physical distancing, washing hands, wearing masks. But as an added level of assurance, in addition to the kind of HVAC quality testing that we've gone through, we also want to offer um, as many air purifiers as are needed um, in our schools. So that's the reason for the motion. Thank you. Any questions or comments about this? Mayor Go ahead. I just, where did the number 2000, $200,000 come from? Is that based on discussions with um, George Vandalinder and... Uh, no. It was a very um, back of the napkin thing today. Unfortunately, it's up to 200000 So we're not planning... I mean, I don't think anyone would spend money on air purifiers that aren't needed, but it's to give some flexibility in our um, discussions and as we're moving forward with coming up with a plan with the teachers. Okay, thank you. That, that, and that's it's also cool. important to know that this process is ongoing currently. The yes. buildings are occupied by our phase two students. Those areas have air purifiers already if they need Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Um, and we just, we don't know what it will cost and we've already spent some money on them already. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's $200,000 in addition to what we've already spent. Correct. Because we do exactly. have them. Yeah, we yeah. do have them. Vice Chair Ekstrom, go ahead. And we're going to cut this off pretty quickly and take a vote. That's okay. So, time. so, yes, he is correct in saying it was sort of the back of a napkin. What we did is looked at the, uh, the air purifiers that we have already and multiplied them by, I believe we've, we, we sort of suspected we needed at least 60 and came up with a number similar to this. It's up to 200,000 because we, the likelihood is that it will be, I don't know, 160. Um, but if for whatever reason we have to change, it's up to 200,000. If it, it, if it goes more than that, it needs to come back and we'll talk about it some more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any last comments on this? Let's go ahead and move to a vote. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you all for that. Um, I would ask now for a motion to put on the table the discussion of the 2021 2022 school calendar. We don't have yet the documents that we need to discuss that. Can I get a motion? So moved, Shansa Musad. And a second. Second. From Member Wall, and let's just move to a vote on that. We'll put it on the next meeting. Member Hollins, what do you need? Please. Well, I just want to say that Ann Valentine earlier in the meeting made a very good point that we need to get whatever 
let the union, uh, they always have input before it comes to the yes, school committee. Okay. Yes, we're just not ready yet. Thank you. I understand. And uh, let's just move to a vote. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Mussad? Yes. Chair Prieti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Reedy Gardner? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you. And now I need a motion to move into executive session uh, for MGLC 30A subsection 21 exemptions number two and three. Number two is to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Number three is to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares and I do declare. Can I get a motion? So moved. Rita Gardner. Mayor Rita Gardner Second, Hollins. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Prayetti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Rita Gardner? Yes. <laughs> motion carries. Okay, and I do need a motion <laughs> to close the public session. However, it is possible in this one that we would actually come back and take a public vote after our executive session. Our technology limits this. So I think we would have to take the public vote at another time. Am I correct on that? We can't, we can't have two sessions going at the same time. WebEx won't let us. No. We could close, we could close it and, re and reopen. We could reopen, uh, but, but no one would know when we'd come back. They'd have to keep clicking and clicking and clicking to see that it was back on, which doesn't seem very open and public. Well, they could also, well, whatever you think makes sense, but there's also the opportunity for people to watch on YouTube and Facebook and other modes. Um, so they could be watching to see when we come back in session that way. True. Okay. I don't know what exactly the topics will be in the executive session, so I think you should decide. But if we're going to take a motion that should then come to public session. I just as soon come back tonight and then it'll be a record of the motion. Maybe people won't be here to hear it, but it won't be delayed for the public to know. And we can record it. We can record it. We can send whatever the minutes are quickly to the paper or something. Okay. So we, the, the, for those who are still on the line and listening to us, we will likely come back to the public session, but it will be closed while we're in the executive session. Uh, we will attempt to reopen that, um, and if that doesn't work, we will schedule um, a public session to take the vote at a later date, because we will not do it without informing the public first. So we will leave the public session open and um, move into executive session at this time, 8.13 p.m. Um, and school committee members, we've gone over a little bit by my 8 o'clock target, so we do need a, a quick break. Please make it quick, otherwise come right to the executive session. Here, I don't see her here. Saad. I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Present. Bawal? Here. Mayor Wiedegardner? Present. We all made it back except for Member Hollins. Okay, so we do have a quorum. Um, we need to take a vote, and I do not, let me see if I do not have the motion, and Susan Farber did not join us. Um, does anyone have the motion written down that we voted on? Of course not. Of course not. Um, in, the, in the previous meeting? Yeah, in the executive session. That's the only thing we're doing here is voting on that. Uh, didn't we say we moved to accept the proposal from TMS? I mean, yes. Wasn't it very simple? Yes, yes. it was. Yes. 
Uh, we move to accept the motion from uh, the management solutions, otherwise known as TMS, uh, for district leadership um, services. Right, that was it. I Do I have that motion? It, mm -hmm. Member Wall makes the motion. Do I have a second? Second by Ekstrom. Any discussion? Okay, and let's move to a roll call vote, please. I wonder if for the good of the public, maybe a little bit more description of what the, what the proposal sure. is. Sure, so I'll quickly describe for people who are listening at home. Uh, TMS is a um, consulting service that currently does our business management operations in the district. Um, in this time of transition with our superintendent, uh, we are hiring them to provide some consultancy services related to uh, the district um, leadership and administrative operations. And there will be more details forthcoming with that very soon. Does that work? Great. Great. Okay. And let's do a roll call vote, please. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Secretary Johnson, we saw it. I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Definitely. Yes. Motion carries. Wonderful. And thank you all. And I will take a motion to. Uh, I'll move. Adjourn. 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 <laughs> Wait, it still need a roll call vote, please. And a second. I second. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Member Karen? That is a yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Uh, Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. And we are adjourned at 9.30 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs>